Hello and welcome back to Phil320 Deductive Logic. Today we're starting our final unit on proofs in QL. Um, so let's get into it. So um, a few things you should know from the get-go about proofs in QL. They work the same as proofs in SL, except we use the sentences of QL instead of the sentences of SL. We have introduction and elimination rules for our quantifiers, our universal and existential quantifiers. We have a new replacement rule, which we call the quantifier negation replacement rule. That's, that's based on the relationship between the existential and the universal quantifier. And we have identity introduction and elimination rules for the identity connective. So let's talk about these additional introduction and elimination rules first. So Perhaps the simplest quantifier rule uh, we have is the universal elimination rule. If you have a universal statement on line M, you can replace it um, with a statement with no universal quantifier and the variable replaced with a constant. So if the variable is X, we can replace it with the constant like C, right? And here you see it um, represented with the meta variables script A, script X, script C. Um, for example, right, if we have the uh, statement for all x, mx, then rxd, we can apply the universal elimination rule and replace the x with whatever quantifier we like. Could be a as on line two, could be d as on line three, any constant will do. Um, and if you think about it, this makes sense because if it's true for all x, then it's going to be true for any, um, any object that's represented by one of our constants. Now, I want to say something about this um, notation we use uh, for the un universal elimination rule. It allows us to create what we call a substitution instance, right? So when we have a universal quantifier uh, case like for all x, and we replace the variable with a constant. We call this the substitution instance, and we call the constant that we use in a substitution instance the instantiating constant, right? Um, so the uh, universal elimination rule just allows us to replace a universal statement with one of its substitution instances and replace the variable with an instantiating constant. Let's look at the next rule, which is also pretty straightforward. It's the existential introduction rule. Um, it's, it's also a direct inference rule, and it's, it makes a certain amount of sense. We, if we have a sentence with a constant in it, we can replace that with an existentially quantified sentence with a variable, right? Um, so for some A with a constant C, we can replace that uh, with there exists some x, a x. And again, this makes sense just based on the definition of the existential quantifier. It tells us that there's at least one thing, right, um, that has of which this statement is true. And um, on line M, we have that one thing uh, uh, spelled out for us, right? Here are some other examples of how we can use the existential introduction rule. We've got on line one, a sentence with uh, constants and no quantifiers. And any of two through six here are legitimate applications of the existential introduction rule. So you notice on line two, for example, we've replaced just the final D in RAD with an X right? Um, whereas on line three, we've replaced both A's in MA and RAD with an X. But on line four, we've just replaced the A in the, um, in the MA, right? And not the A in the consequent of the conditional, right? Um, so the X that we introduce with our existential quantifier introduction rule can replace some or all of the occurrences of whatever our constant C is, right? Um, it's very flexible. And you see in five, line five and line six, we can even apply the rule multiple times to deal with multiple constants. The universal introduction rule is a little bit more complicated, right? 
it looks a lot like the existential introduction rule, right? With a caveat, right? So we have some line M that has a sentence with a constant in it, right? So call that sentence A, call that constant C. We can replace that constant C with a variable and apply the universal quantifier, but only if the constant C does not occur in any of the premises of our argument or in any undischarged assumption in a subproof. Only if you have got it there totally arbitrarily um, can you use it in a universal introduction. Okay, um, so what does that look like? Let's look at an example. I have here a proof that starts with a simple indirect proof um, that proves a theorem that we proved a version of in SL previously, right, in, in one of our homeworks. Um, and it is a pretty straightforward. We assume for the sake of a conditional introduction, DF, right? Um, that's an atomic uh, sentence with a constant F. Reiteration rule, we bring it down to line two, and that gives us this conditional. We know this is a theorem. It's a tautology. We've shown it multiple ways in past units, right? If DF, then DF, right? Now that we've got that, and since F doesn't appear in a premise, there are no premises in this argument, and since we've discharged the subproof, so it's no longer the assumption of, a sub, of an undischarged subproof, we satisfy that condition on this rule, and we can um, eliminate the constant, replace it with the variable, in this case Z, to get line four and use the universal introduction rule. The reason I can use the universal introduction rule in this way is because I could have picked any constant whatsoever. A, B, C, D, E, F, etc. It doesn't matter, right? Um, it is arbitrary. If it's arbitrary, then the same form of this sentence three should apply to anything whatsoever because I didn't pick out anything specific, right? Um, I don't have any conditions that are that are holding me to F. The final and most complicated of our basic uh, quantifier rules is the existential elimination rule, right? Um, and we represent it in this way. We need an existential statement um, with a variable in it. Um, we need to create a subproof, um, and we need to derive some conclusion that is independent of the substitution instance we assumed for our subproof. So let me walk you through this. I have some existential statement. There exists some X, AX. Remember my X and A here on line M are meta variables. It could be any variable, X, Y, Z, could be any more complex sentence, which we call A with the script A. Um, on line N, I start a subproof by assuming a substitution instance of line M, right? So I've replaced all the instances of the variable X with the constant C, and I have uh, started a subproof. The C can't be a constant that's already in M, right? It can't appear in the existential statement itself. Right. It also can't appear in any undischarged assumption of a subproof that we're still in. It can't appear in a premise of the argument. It has to be a new constant. Right. And then I need to derive some conclusion, call it B, that doesn't have the constant either. So C cannot appear in B. It cannot appear in uh, the original existential, and it can appear in any premise or undischarged assumption. Um, and again, this is to capture the fact that it, it has to be an arbitrarily chosen constant, right? And you have to get rid of it, that constant before you exit the subproof, because we know that something exists that satisfies A, right? That's what line M tells us, but we don't know what it is, right? So we're using C to refer to it temporarily, but we don't know that C is actually the thing, right? We're just using it as a placeholder. This will make more sense if we look at an example. So we've got two premises here. Premise one gives us this existential 
uh, there exists an x, sx, that we're going to apply the existential elimination rule. Line 2 gives us this simple conditional uh, for all x, if sx, then tx, or all s's are t's, um, more colloquially, that we will use to do our derivation. We start on line 3 with a subproof. And our subproof starts with a substitution instance of line one, right? That's the existential we're eliminating, right? Um, I chose A here at random, right? Um, it doesn't appear in, in any previous part of the proof. That's crucial. Um, and then I work through the proof line four, five, and six, fairly straightforward. I apply the universal elimination rule to line two. There are no conditions on the constant I use there because it applies to all x, right? So I can do the a again. Um, and then a conditional elimination rule to get line 5. That works just like SL. I apply my existential introduction rule, right? Which I can do um, without any conditions on the, um, on the constant I've chosen right? And I get there exists an x, t, x, right? Now line six there, there exists an x, t, x. There are no variables in there. Most crucially, the variable a does not appear. And so I've satisfied uh, my desire to get some b, some specific b, that doesn't have the constant in it. Now I can close my subproof, discharge my original assumption, um, and uh, we represent uh, the rule in this way, right? Um, existential elimination line one tells us the original existential that we're eliminating. Lines three through six are the lines of the subproof. And I've repeated the way this is all the way this always goes. I've repeated on line seven what I had on line six, just outside the subproof. Okay, so that's how the existential elimination works. I've stepped through it kind of slowly because it is, I think, the most difficult of these rules. We also get a new replacement rule for QL, which we call quantifier negation. And this just depends on the way the two quantifiers are defined in relation to one another, right? The negation of a universal is equivalent to the existential of a negation and vice versa, right? So I can move the negation in or out of the quantifier and it flips from being universal to existential in this way, right? Um, and, and this is a replacement rule, so we can apply this to partial sentences. We can apply this to parts of our, of our lines, right? Um, whereas all of the existential um, and universal introduction and elimination rules have to apply to the, the whole sentence with the quantifier is the main connective we're looking at. We also have identity introduction and elimination rules. Remember from the earlier unit where we introduced the identity predicate, it is a predicate, right? Um, a relation specifically, a two-place predicate, um, but it's also a special logical connective as a special logical meaning, which we use the equal sign to represent. The introduction rule for identity is simple. We can always introduce C equals C for any constant, right? Any constant will be equal to itself, right? Um, that's just true by definition, right? And so we can always bring this online, right? Um, it doesn't seem obviously super useful, but in certain kinds of um, indirect proof situations, it, you can use it um, to, to your benefit. More useful in doing proofs involving identity, perhaps, is the elimination rule, right? If we know two constants are equal, if we know some constant C and some constant D are equal, then any, um, any sentence A that has constant C in it, we can replace it with the constant D. We can, if we know that two constants are equal, we can substitute them one for the other in any statement, right? Um, we can also, we can replace D with C, we can replace C with D. They can be traded back and forth, right? Um, and so those are the special introduction and elimination rules that we get for the identity predicate. 
What I want to do next is I want us to look at some examples. I want you to pause the video and try providing proofs for these, uh, these three arguments. Um, and then we'll check our work together. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna open up Carnap and uh, we'll, we'll try to prove these three arguments. So here we go with our first argument, which I've already put our two premises here. And we, what we wanna get is for all x, ax then cx, right? So I'm gonna start just by thinking about, okay, what I've got, I've got these um, universal quantifiers here. So um, what I'm going to start with is just manipulating these by using the universal elimination rule. So let's pick the constant A to do um, the elimination on this first line. If AA, then BA, that's universal elimination on line one. And we can do the same for line two. That's universal elimination on line two. That's nice because it gets us some conditionals that we can work with here. What I'm gonna do next is I'm going to apply the hypothetical syllogism, right? That tells us that we can conclude if AA then CA through hypothetical syllogisms on line three and four, right? Another way to do this would be through an indirect proof to get a conditional introduction. Now, because my constant A uh, doesn't exist in any of my premises, I haven't done any assumptions for a subproof, so I don't have to worry about that either. I can go ahead and reintroduce my universal quantifier to get for all X, AX, then CX. That's my universal introduction rule on line five, and that completes my proof. Let's go on to our second example. Here, I have um, a universal that's a little complex. I've got this if AX, then BX or, or CX. I've got AG and not BG, I wanna get CG, okay? So first, again, let's, let's manipulate what we have to get rid of that universal quantifier. So I'm gonna do AG then BG or CG, universal elimination on line one. Now I have this conjunction on line two, so I can disaggregate this, use my conjunction elimination rule on line two to pull out the AG. The AG is the antecedent of line three, so I can um, use my conditional elimination rule to get BG or CG. That's conditional elimination on line three and four. And then I wanna get, I wanna get that CG out. How am I gonna do that? Well, I got not BG in that, con, in that conjunction from before. So I can do conjunction elimination again to get not BG. And then if you look at five and six, that's the form of our disjunction elimination rule. So that can get me CG through disjunction elimination on line five and six. And that finishes our proof. Note that if we wanted to, we could not do universal introduction in here to get AX, CX through universal introduction on line seven because the term G is uh, here Carnap says it's not fresh, which is a funny way to put it. It appears in premise two, so we can't rely on it for this, right? We can't use it in this, in this case. All right, let's carry on to the third proof. I hope you did well on the first two. So this third proof, we have, again, um, the same first premise for all X, if AX, then either BX or CX. Um, but I have this existential, there exists an X, AX and not CX. And I wanna get, and I wanna get there exists an X, BX, right? So I'm gonna start again the same way. I'll even use the same uh, constant. 
I'll cheat a little bit and copy paste here, right? That'll work. Now, um, because I have an existential here, instead of something with a constant in it, I have to use my existential el elimination rule to get at any of this stuff. Um, remember, for the existential elimination rule, I need to start a subproof um, where I assume the substitution instance of um, my original existential. So this is my assumption. I want to get exbx here. So now I've got my same kind of uh, conjunction here. So I can use the same structure I used before to get um, the AG out. I can get BG or CG again through conditional elimination, although my line numbers have changed. Now it's line three and five. I could get not CG also through conjunction elimination on line four. And that means I can get BG through disjunction elimination with our disjunction on line six and our negation of one of the disjuncts on line seven, right? Still not where I wanna be because I still got that constant. I gotta get rid of that constant before I can end the subproof. But um, I'm close because I can use the existential introduction rule to get there exists an X, BX, right? That's existential introduction on line eight. So that's good. Um, that's what I need, right? That's what I wanted. So um, I'm going to repeat that here on line 10. And that's the existential elimination rule. My existential is on line two. My subproof is on lines four through nine. That gets me my conclusion. That proof is complete. How did you do with those proofs? I hope you got the hang of it. If you have any questions, of course, send me a note or come by my office hours and we can talk it through. Next time, I will talk about how to combine uh, proofs with translations and we will look at some more examples. I look forward to seeing you then. Before you check out the next lecture, I do encourage you to try out a couple of the practice exercises. All right, good luck, bye.